Good morning. <laughs> this is great when the audience is ready to begin before the, at least the, one of the moderators is ready. So <laughs> anyway, I'm Nancy Hensel, and I'm uh, president of New American Colleges and Universities, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this um, panel discussion this morning. Um, the New American Colleges is a consortium of 21 colleges and universities, private liberal arts colleges, um, in 16 different states. And our members are committed to the integration of liberal arts, professional studies, and civic engagement, because we believe that's the best way to prepare students for lives of meaning and career achievement. And so this morning we have three panelists, which I'll introduce in a moment. But I also wanted to bring your attention, and I hope as you've come in, that you've had a chance to look at the posters, because we have um, nine students that are here from other um, colleges that brought posters that also are examples of the work that our students are, are doing on our campuses. So let me just, and I'm not gonna be able to point out which poster is which, but the students that are here are Emily Cutler from Manhattan College, um, Christopher Hoey um, from Manhattan College, Chris Jackson from St. Edwards University, Justin Lang from Belmont University, Cheyenne Roman uh, from uh, St. Edwards, and Bonnie Torres Pagan and Kayla Wyant from um, the University of New Haven, and John Trieste from Manhattan College, and Victoria Walker from uh, the University of Laverne. Um, so after we're finished with our panel, maybe you'll have a little bit more time to look at, at the posters um, and talk with the students about their work. So let me begin, I guess, our, our morning then discussion. Our moderator this morning will be um, Dr. William Sullivan, who is um, a senior scholar with the New American Colleges and Universities and also the Center of Inquiry in the Liberal Arts at Wabash College. And he was formerly a senior scholar at the Carnegie Foundation uh, for the Advancement of Teaching, where he co-directed the, um, the Preparation for professional, Professions program, which is one of the reasons we were so pleased when Bill is writing a book about New American Colleges, um, which there's a flyer in your packet about that. Um, so some of the books he's written have been, um, uh, lost my place here. Um, well, he was a co-author of Habits of the Heart. Some of you remember that book, which is a wonderful book. Um, we used it when I was a professor in our first year freshman seminar. He's written The New Agenda for Higher Education, Work in Integrity, and Educating Lawyers, um, and also The Good Society. And right now he's been working on um, a book that, um, that will be published sometime in late spring, which is uh, The Power of Integrated Learning, Higher Education for Success in Life, Work, and Society. And that's the topic for our session this morning. So let me just briefly introduce our students and then I'll turn it over to Bill. So the students on the panel this morning are Jack Ryan uh, from North Central College, Dylan Gray from Manhattan College, and Daniel Gutierrez de la Garza from Wagner College. I guess I didn't do that in the order you're sitting, but anyway, <laughs> you, you will know which one Danielle is. Um, uh, Jack is currently finishing his junior year at North Central um, College, where he's pursuing um, degree, a dual degree in theater and mathematics. And I just thought that was such an interesting combination. I was a theater major in college. Math I didn't do so well in, so, <laughs> um, so I was fascinated by that. And he's going to talk a little bit about that. And he also has a minor in... Um, computer science, and for those of you who are at universities, eventually he wants to teach mathematics at the university, so keep an eye on him. Um, and um, our next student is Danielle, um, who is also a junior at Wagner College, and she's majoring in anthropology, and she's doing research in Me the Mexican government um, relations with in the indigenous um, communities in Mexico. And when she graduates, she wants to work um, in a career with a non-governmental organization. And I believe back in Mexico, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Um, she's actually from Mexico. Um, and Dylan is a senior at Manhattan College where he's majoring in physics, 
and minoring in philosophy. And uh, that's an interesting combination, too. Um, and he began doing his undergraduate research um, in his sophomore year, and he's worked as an assistant lab technician, and he's also been tutoring students. And he's going to talk with you about a very exciting project I think he's been working on at um, CERN, um, which is part of a national science um, funded, foundation funded project uh, for his senior's thesis. So let me turn it over to you, Bill. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, bright and early on this um, brisk Washington morning. Uh, <coughs> just come from San Francisco last night where we were having much needed rain, but it's a bit of a shock to come from this very wet, uh, you know, heavy environment to suddenly ultra dry. So if my voice sounds a little strange, I'm hoping it'll clear up in the course of the morning. And let me say, I'm really delighted to have an opportunity to be here this morning having just spent, as Nancy said, uh, much of the last year working on a book on the uh, New American Colleges and Universities and their model of education. And I think actually all I will need to do this morning is to make a few general introductory remarks and the students will, uh, I think you'll find, be more than capable of carrying it from there. The, the ground rules are going to be fairly simple and that is that each of the panelists will have a chance to talk a bit about their uh, activities and uh, what they uh, hope to do with these. And then after that, I'm going to ask a few questions of the panelists to try to give them a chance to be uh, spontaneous in um, reflecting on their education in the various <coughs> institutions, all parts of this uh, consortium, the New American Colleges and Universities. And then following that, we really would like to have a, a general discussion. So please be prepared with uh, some questions and ideas, and, and I'm sure the panelists will be happy to follow up any thoughts that uh, they may spark initially as they make their presentations. So let me just say to, to set the frame a bit that um, I was, at least a couple of years ago, an outsider to the New American Colleges and Universities. I had known about the institution and the organization rather for some time I had thought generally well and certainly uh, thought very well of the founding idea which as Nancy said was really to uh, understand the college in America as having a distinctive heritage and a distinctive purpose and this was an idea that um, the then president of the Carnegie Foundation Ernest Boyer proposed in the mid-1990s. So this is 20 years, or we're just past 20 years after the foundation of this organization. And Ernest Boyer's idea was that what was distinctive about <coughs> American higher education that set it off from models of the university in the United Kingdom or in Europe or other places in the world was that the American college really embraced three goals. And the three goals were to provide what would be recognized uh, as a liberal arts education, so a broad understanding of the world brought through knowledge of the disciplines, the arts and sciences, and we're gonna hear about what those look like in the contemporary form in just a couple of minutes. And at the same time, with a practical purpose, that is to say, to, to educate future professionals for American society. And that was the second big idea that Boyer stressed, that the unique feature of these institutions and what he thought ought to be true of American higher education more broadly was that the liberal arts would be connected to professional preparation. And then beyond that, Boyer argued that the purpose of higher education in the United States has from the beginning of the Republic always had a, pur a purpose as a purpose the enhancement of American civic life. And therefore, such a college education, he argued, would not be complete if students did not have an opportunity to begin to develop their understanding of themselves, of their professional knowledge of within a broader liberal arts understanding of the world in connection with their future and present lives as citizens of the United States and more broadly citizens 
of a more and more interdependent world. So that was Boyer's idea. And what I found in spending the last year or so uh, investigating the uh, mode of education in these uh, institutions is that they, in fact, I think, outline in their practices a model of higher education that's consistent with what Boyer and his other founding uh, members in 1995 had proposed, but which I think now we can specify more clearly. And I'll just state those features and then uh, turn it over to our panelists. And I was very struck, actually, by the, the notion that these are institutions which not only give a kind of uh, general lip service to the idea of integrating the liberal arts with professional preparation and trying to enhance students' concern with uh, the larger civic world, but they actually try to embody this in concrete programs of study. So this is, these are institutions that provide courses of study that actually do integrate these things. And that's really the first and, and I think most extraordinary point about this consortium. As you'll see, these are, are often done in very unique and different ways. <coughs> but still, there's this strong common purpose. But secondly, it was also very impressive to me that in a number of instances, these are institutions that also have learned a lot about what has been learned about learning over the last 20 years. These are institutions, in other words, which have really attempted to uh, make as standard practice what are, is now called in the higher education community high impact learning practices. Forms of learning which research indicates are more effective very often than the more traditional forms of what I'm doing now, of simply standing in front of a class and lecturing. And we'll hear more about that this morning as well. The third aspect of this model, however, is that none of this would work, and I really am, am quite convinced of this after what I've seen, none of this would work if it did not take place in a certain kind of campus community. So it is really, in, in many ways, the achievement of these institutions to create a kind of campus environment, a, a campus culture, if you want, that, that cultivates a kind of uh, set of expectations that are both inclusive and supportive and yet quite academically demanding. And that's really the combination that, again, the research indicates is most important for student achievement, an environment that is welcoming, inclusive, and yet makes high academic demands and supports students in meeting those demands. And then finally and fourth is uh, a pronounced attention to what the founding documents refer to as the cultivation of a civic sense or civic spirit. So we're going to hear some more interesting forms of this than, than I can provide in an um, outline. <coughs> and so I'd like to turn this over to uh, our panelists. And we'll go in the order in which it's uh, described in your program, which actually goes right across this way, um, beginning with Dylan Gray from Manhattan College. Dylan? Good morning. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today, especially since it's so cold. <laughs> I would like to thank the NACNU for organizing this event and also Manhattan College for making my trip down here possible. My name is Dylan Gray, a senior physics major and philosophy minor from Manhattan College in the Bronx, New York. And I have been fortunate enough to be doing research with one of my professors, Dr. Rostislav Konopolich, since the summer of my sophomore year. This past summer, I was able to go to the European Organization for Nuclear Research, also known as CERN, in Geneva, Switzerland. I was funded by Dr. Konopolich's National Science Foundation grant, while also being hosted by the New York University Department of Physics. While, in, while at CERN, I was able to participate on a collaborative research project for the ATLAS experiment. The ATLAS experiment, an international collaboration, is part of the Large Hadron Collider, at, or the LHC, at CERN. It, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN uses high energy proton collisions to produce and study fundamental particles such as the Higgs boson. Members of the ATLAS collaboration work on running the detector in the control room, working in labs for development, data analysis, as well as theoretical and computational work. 
the research project that I was involved with was composed of senior scientists, doctoral students, and postdocs from all around the world in different institutions. I had a small part in the project that the team was researching for the Atlas collaboration. The name of the project is Study of Higgs Boson Production in Different Channels at the Large Hadron Collider. In physics, there is a model that tries to explain the fundamental forces and particle interactions that make up everything in the universe called the standard model. This model is not entirely complete, and current new physics not explained by the standard model comes from beyond standard model physics. The Higgs field is a scalar field that acts as the mechanism in which all other matter acquires a mass. The Higgs boson can be produced in many different ways, just as other particles, and one of those ways it can be produced is through a process known as vector boson fusion. One of the things that cannot be fully understood by the standard model is the Higgs boson production vertex, which is the point where the initial particles interact to produce <coughs> the final particle, the Higgs boson. The production vertex is studied to look at properties of the Higgs boson, and in this case, specifically the contribution of couplings. This vertex helps us understand beyond standard model physics, which occurs at a higher energy scale and the theory applied to describe it. My portion of the summer project was to contribute to the development of a code that will help scientists to study the production vertex and couplings relative to different processes. The work being done at CERN provides a deeper understanding of the fundamentals of our universe and with our project helps us understand more about the Higgs boson. In addition, this research helps us further define and understand beyond standard model physics. This will give us insight on how to amend the standard model. The work being done at CERN to study beyond standard model physics gives us a deeper understanding of the fundamental particles that create matter and will even give us insight on black holes, dark energy, and dark matter, which pertain to astrophysics. The LHC is performing experiments that help us understand what the universe was like microseconds after the Big Bang, how it developed to what it is now, and what the fate of the universe is. This code is important because it allows for other scientists at CERN to be able to perform calculations that, along with new LHC data, may lead to exciting new results with the possibility <coughs> of new physics. I was able to see how some of this new physics may be discovered by my working with Atlas members directly. Dr. Konopolich introduced me to one of his colleagues, a full-time scientist for the Atlas team. Through this connection, I was able to see what a true collaborative project is like. While at CERN, I was able to work with Atlas firsthand in a few different capacities. Being able to work so directly with Atlas was incredible because I was able to see and do things that most people don't get to, even if they are part of the Atlas collaboration. For three weeks, I shadowed a few scientists and their colleagues in different parts of Atlas where they showed and let me help with their work. For my first week there, I was working with an engineer who was in charge of installing various things to the data acquisition racks. I accompanied him into the caverns, which is an area about 100 meters below ground. There, I helped him install cooling racks and pipes to the data acquisition racks. I also helped install different monitoring sensors to the racks, and he explained to me how some of the circuits are made up by connecting each sensor to each other. When I was working on the sensors, I noticed what looked like a broken wire, and I was going to remove it, but I asked the engineer first, and he told me that had I removed that wire, that the entire detector would have shut down because the circuit would no longer have been mirrored. <laughs> The next week, I was working with a run coordinator in the Atlas control room, who showed me what the, how the Atlas detector works from the control room. I was able to experience what it is like to have shifts, where people monitor different things from the Atlas control room. He explained to me a lot about the control room, such as the detector and the sub-detector status screens, as well as the status of the beam from certain central control. Working with him was great, because he informed me so much about the general operation of the LHC, as well as Atlas. My last week there, I was working with the people in the Atlas Satellite Control Room, who were mainly involved with the software side of things. I worked with a scientist who was doing the circuit mapping for the data acquisition rack testing. He showed me a lab that he was using to do sensor durability testing. I was also working with a group of scientists who were in charge of the data acquisition racks for the new sub-detector. They showed me the software that they were using for it, as well as the actual computer boards. I went down to the caverns with them as well, where we hooked up the racks, where we hooked up the boards to actual data acquisition racks for testing. I was also helping them doing signal testing on the test data acquisition racks. I felt particularly useful here because they were using oscilloscopes, which is the only piece of equipment I was really familiar with while there. <coughs> Being able to work for and exploring Atlas was an amazing and truly unique experience. My trip to CERN helped me realize a goal. Being in a research facility was great because I fell in love with the environment. I really enjoyed working in labs, and the people I worked with 
show me how interesting it is. The idea of having colleagues working collaboratively on a research project and even witnessing it is inspiring and exciting. Being at CERN, I realized that working in labs on an intricate project with other scientists is what I want to do. So my goal for after completing my undergraduate studies is to attend graduate school in hopes of receiving a PhD in applied physics with a concentration in material science. The reason why I want to take this path is because I love physics and want to learn as much as I can. Getting a degree in applied physics will enable me to apply my physics knowledge to help solve new problems. At the heart of any product, there is some research and development period which needs scientists to figure things out. Physicists are often found in R&D labs working on new materials that can prove to be useful. With an applied physics PhD, I could work in a variety of places, including government, industry, and academic labs. With an, uh, I want to be a research scientist working in labs, and applied physics will give me both a skill and knowledge set that can make me adaptable to many fields. I could end up working on energy storage problems, quantum information technology, and even biomaterials. A degree in this would open a door to a world of career possibilities doing something that I have discovered that I love and am driven by. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dylan. And, and our uh, next panelist is Daniela Gutierrez de la um, Garza uh, from uh, Wagner College, a near neighbor of uh, Manhattan. <clears throat> Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, my project's title is Understanding the Impact of um, Government Indigenous Communities uh, Relations in Durango, Mexico. Before I explain my project, I think it would be good to give you all some context. Durango is the capital city of Durango, a state in Mexico. And according to a 2010 census carried out by the CDI, which in Spanish stands for the National Commission for the Development of Indigenous Communities, um, of a total population of around 1.6 million uh, in the state, uh, 44,722 were indigenous. This represents approximately 3% of the population in the state. Um, many of these communities live uh, near the highways and others live as far away as uh, five hours into the mountains from the capital. In order to, um, to get to these communities in particular, one must travel uh, narrow, unpaved roads, which have uh, no lighting and no uh, protection preventing cars from falling off the edge. Even the streets that are paved uh, have huge rocks in the middle of them. These conditions alone may be perceived as lack of true government involvement. Um, so all of this made me wonder how come that in this modern time uh, indigenous communities continue to live in such states of marginalization. I wondered what kind of help the government um, gives, for what purpose and with what outcome. Um, I wondered which were the obstacles that both uh, the indigenous community and the government found in trying to improve uh, life conditions for these uh, citizens. And I also wanted to learn how um, this indigenous community perceives itself and how they help themselves. So in order to prepare for a career in NGO and development work, uh, my capstone project took the, took the form of a grant proposal, um, which was based both in literature and experiential uh, pilot research. Um, it is composed of six sections, which are theoretical orientation, um, research design and hypotheses, ethnographic setting and study population, methodology, data collection and analysis, feasibility and research competence, and finally, anthropological significance. The theoretical orientation section provided the uh, intellectual framework for my research. I drew from authors such as Manuel Gamio, Nestor Canclini, and Aida Hernandez, who write about Mexico's um, history, uh, search for modernization, and um, social movements regarding indigenous groups. On the research design and hypothesis section, I stated my hypothesis for the indigenous community um, current circumstances. 
in which I, I believe the, uh, they are the result of a series of social, economic, and political um, factors, which at the same time are resulting of Mexico's um, historical experience and the dynamics between <coughs> the, uh, the dynamics of uh, different um, power relationships between different parties. Um, historical context, social, uh, location, and social media continue to play an important role in the lives of indigenous people. Uh, due to isolation and lack of means of communication, um, the indigenous communities might find themselves at a disadvantaged power level in contrast to the government who may neglect or simply fail to um, provide basic needs for them. Um, so in the, oh, because of these, on the ethnographic um, setting and study population, I chose to concentrate in studying a um, indigenous community living the farthest away from the capital, because I believe these communities uh, develop a special relationship with the government, since the government becomes an essential source of necessary goods uh, for them. And on the methodology and data co collection and analy uh, analysis section, um, because this is a grant proposal, I stated that I would spend 12 months as an intern at the CDI and as a participant observant in the indigenous community living in the mountains. I would also collect data from um, the non-indigenous population living in the, in the city of Durango and other government representatives. I wanted to do this because um, I wanted to see how each party interacted with one another, how they perceived each other, and how all of these resulted in all of their contemporary experience. I also wanted to see which um, cultural ideas are being reinforced through daily actions. So concentrating on each uh, group, I would um, carry out participant observation, semi-structured interviews, and life history narratives, paying special attention to each individual's um, sex, socioeconomic status, and ethnical affiliation, as these um, factors may influence the resulting data. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, also um, on the, oh, I, w I said, I stated that I would, um, um, how I would uh, record my, my research uh, in a journal and recording also the changing perspectives over uh, each study population as an anthropological, ethnographic um, study the nature of the study, my perspectives may change about um, each social group. Um, and the feasibility and research competence section, I stated um, my, why am I qualified to carry such a research? I mentioned my past experiences carrying out participant observation, um, semi-structured interviews, and I also created a schedule in which I would um, dedicate a specified amount of time in each for each um, population group. And lastly, on the anthropological significance um, section, I mentioned how this research would contribute to ideas uh, like Boas historical particularism, Foucault's theory on discourse, and Spivak's uh, epistemic violence. And uh, I would also I also stated that this research would uh, be of incredible significance for the indigenous community itself and the government um, to understand why it is that uh, all, over, all around Mexico, indigenous communities continue to live in what we believe is marginalization. Um, and how come government organizations such as the CDI haven't been able to completely uh, reach their objectives regarding indigenous communities. Um, this project is usually done during the senior year uh, however, for, I had the fortune to do it junior, during my junior year. This opened um, the doors for me to learn about a, a topic I did not know much about, even though I'm Mexican, that concerned me personally as a Mexican. Um, to do, through this project, I was able to make connections with these communities um, and find my passion, which is uh, working in NGO um, development work. Um, 
and through my studies uh, where it doesn't matter the cor course I'm taking, whether it be um, anthropology, history, economics, philosophy, I am able to use everything in my project because um, with human beings I've learned that it's, ne it's never only one thing that affects our experience. Um, so that's my project. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. And uh, for our third panelist, we're going to go finally out of New York City um, <laughs> to North Central College, where our speaker will be uh, Jack Ryan. Good morning. So my name is Jack Ryan, and I'm a senior at North Central College. Um, so I'm pursuing dual degrees in math and theater with a minor in computer science, and I'm part of our College Scholars Honors Program at North Central. I'm also a member of our math club, uh, Blue Key National Honor Society, and our theater department. So this morning I'll be talking a bit about the research I'm doing to complete my undergraduate thesis um, with a special emphasis on the impact that the liberal arts education has had on my ability to conduct this scholarly research as well as the impact on my learning and future career. Um, so to give you a bit of a background on my research project, um, the title is called Betting Better on Broadway, the application of statistical matrix theory to the prediction of Tony Awards for best play and best musical. <laughs> So this project is completed as my undergraduate thesis, which is completed in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the College Scholars Program, which is our honors program on campus. Um, so we aim to analyze um, what previous scholarship has done is given us statistical principles and methods to rank sports teams based on, on the number of wins and losses and the margin by which one team particularly wins. So Kali and Massey are two practitioners who suggest um, two such methods, which uses those wins and losses and or margin of victory as inputs into these algorithms. Um, so they um, yield a definitive ranking of the sports teams based on these input values. Um, so our research project is interested in applying these methods to theatrical productions in an attempt to rank works of theater using quantitative values. So the quantifiers we're using in this project include the weekly percentage of seats sold, um, the weekly number of seats sold, the weekly average ticket cost, the weekly top ticket cost, and then finally the weekly gross profit of the show. Um, so Tony Award nominees from the past 10 years were ranked using these methods, um, and the quantifier method combination which yielded the most um, promising prediction are determined. Um, and then these method quantifier combinations are going to be used in the near future to predict the Tony Award winners for best play and best musical for the 2015-16 season. Um, so it adds to this conversation by employing methods that are previously used to um, analyze sports teams to quantitatively analyze art, which can be challenging and isn't always done. Um, so the, they've only usually been used to rank sports teams. So it also yields an interesting discussion as to whether the Tony Awards reflect the commercial success of a piece of theater or rather its artistic merit. So our methodology included gaining an understanding of the current processes of Tony Award selection. That way we could uncover potential biases. Um, and then we looked at collecting and organizing the data from the Tony nominees from the past 10 years running these algorithms on our data sets and determining which quantifiers or a combination of quantifiers is the best predictor of Tony Award success, um, and then using these as a basis to predict the 2016 awards. So I'm gonna talk a bit more about our specific results towards the end, but sort of shift and talk about resources and mentoring that led to the formulation of the project. Um, so I've been a bit nervous about selecting a topic for the undergraduate thesis um, since freshman year because it seems like such a large project and really reflects the culmination of your undergraduate coursework. I was assured by my older colleagues that you'll get an idea and it'll come to you, but I wasn't sure. Um, but sure enough, as a result of the intimate class sizes and personal mentoring that happens at North Central, I was able to find a topic that excited me and inspired me to begin working. So the basis came during the spring of my sophomore year in linear algebra class when we were doing a project about these Kali and Massey methods. Um, we basically took a fake season where my professor had formulated scores and used both methods to um, rank these different sports teams. So I really enjoyed this project and her course in general and went into her office to chat with her about potential ways of expanding this. Um, so we tossed around ideas such as using it on reality TV shows such as The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Um, but I ultimately decided at that point that I wanted to use it on critical reviews 
of musicals and plays in an attempt to merge my interests in theater and math. Um, so that sort of evolved over time, but the project transitioned into the research questions, which I previously presented. Um, but I'm trying to guess, I guess, say that it would not have been possible without the close mentoring of my advisor and professor. And because of these small classes, which are standard in the liberal arts environment, um, it created a classroom setting which was able to cultivate this type of learning um, process. So we had the ability to cover these topics, such as the Kali and Massey methods, which might not normally be covered in an undergraduate linear algebra course, um, just because of the subject matter. Um, the limited number of students also permitted me to have the ability to actually talk to my professor individually about the project and its potential um, applications, and that it allowed it to grow from a simple question into an entire research project. Um, so my ability to pursue not only this research project, but other scholarly research um, is a direct result of the access to faculty mentoring and small class sizes. Um, it's also had a significant impact on my learning. So it required me to learn the discipline required to pursue an individual research project. So instead of being told what questions um, to answer, I have the freedom and then also the challenge of choosing my own questions. Um, it's in distinct contrast to most undergraduate coursework where you are laid out with the questions and told to answer those. Um, and it certainly seems to be a shift towards the kind of coursework I'll encounter at the graduate school level. Um, I've learned how to ask questions of myself and be self-critical of my work while also having the confidence in my research methodologies to know that I'm pursuing this project um, in the way that would yield definitive results. Um, so I'm also faced with being the expert in the subject material. So while my thesis advisor, Dr. Katherine Heller, is an invaluable res uh, resource to me, and I'm tremendously grateful for her, um, she doesn't always have the answers like she would if she were teaching the course. Um, so I've, in this way, I've learned to be confident in my methodologies and learn how to defend my claims and their validity. Um, I've also learned how to stay motivated to work on this long-term research project, which at times, um, you don't have any interest in working on. Um, so as opposed to undergraduate coursework, we're told when particular homework assignments are due. Um, but the thesis, we're simply told a rough draft is due on this date and a final draft on the other date. And you're sort of left to complete the project on your own time. So it's beneficial because it promotes flexibility and is definitely more of a shift towards that higher level of learning. Um, but it also can be challenging because the motivation has to be completely intrinsic. So all in all, while the completion of the undergraduate thesis certainly poses challenges, the rewards, I think, outweigh the drawbacks exponentially. And there's much I've learned both about the subject material and as well as general research methodologies and time management and writing skills. Um, having the opportunity to conduct this research project will have tremendous implications for my future career. Um, I'm currently planning on pursuing graduate work in math to obtain my PhD and then be a college professor. Um, so this project, along with other summer research projects I've done at other institutions, um, have not only strengthened my confidence in my ability to pursue individual research projects, but has also helped to model the type of interactions I would like to have with future students. So in addition to pursuing my own research agenda in the field of pure mathematics, um, I hope to create, cultivate a love for mathematical research in my students and to help hone their research skills. So my career goals stem from a deep desire to both extend the community of next generation mathematicians and also introduce them to the um, fun of math research for those who might not have tried it. So having the opportunity to work with such talented professors, advisors, and mentors, I hope to be able to mirror um, the manner in which they approach research with undergraduates, which I think will hope, I hope will ultimately make me a more um, a successful research mentor at that point. So my future career will be impacted by this research project, um, not only by the physical acquisition of new knowledge, but also in the way that I'm able to um, observe best practices in supervising research. So in terms of our results, we're still in the process of this. We're not done until um, May when the thesis is due. So we're still in the process of collecting and analyzing results. Um, but our preliminary findings indicate a stronger ability of the methods to predict play success compared to musicals, which is fairly interesting. And I'm sort of trying to think through why that might be. Um, but at this point, we have a general idea of the quantifiers, which seem to continuously seem to be the best predictors. Um, and our methods are in the process of being changed and analyzed so that we can get stronger results. Um, and then we can make the most accurate prediction for that 2015-16 season. Um, I'm excited, though, about our prospects for accurately predicting the series winners. And I just want to thank everyone for being here this morning. Uh, so you can see this is certainly a diverse panel in terms of ideas. And um, I suspect most of us, if, if you feel like I do, it would be interesting to hear more. Um, 
and we'd all probably learn a good deal about, about these <coughs> fields uh, by doing that. And so you'll have an opportunity to hear a bit more. And I thought uh, we can just move right from uh, the, the last uh, theme, which is really, I'd like to ask the panelists if they would just say a little bit about their own experience of when they saw the relevance of their liberal arts, arts and sciences um, education for their professional fields or what they were beginning to see as their professional development. In other words, a little bit about how you see this kind of integration that uh, New American Colleges and Universities likes to talk about in your own experience. No particular order. Uh, you guys are both looking at me. <laughs> um, so my liberal arts education became connected to my professional studies when I started to adopt my philosophical mindset that I attained from my philosophy minor. Because in my philosophy classes, you have to adapt certain tools and skills to be able to you know, learn and do philosophy. And I think that's relevant because those skills are pretty important just in general. <coughs> You're able to apply them to anything. So, you know, skills such as critical thinking, analysis, logical, and questioning skills. And then these things are rather intuitive and almost instinctive to humans, so you could really apply them to any subject. So that's how it became connected for me. <clears throat> um, well, for me, um, I think it was um, when I had this experience with this indigenous community and as I noticed that there is so many things that go into their experience. There are so many um, topics. Uh, I found that especially economics related to their situation and history. So yes, it was that experience for me. Um, I think for me it was, I think the liberal arts education does an exceptional job of promoting um, group work together, especially in a lot of our courses we have the opportunity to work closely with our peers and faculty members and that was one thing that was extremely extremely beneficial for me when I was doing an NSF REU uh, research experience for undergraduates this past summer. So there were five of us undergraduates working with a faculty advisor on a research project in algebra um, and we were able to work very closely together and understand how to ask each other particular questions questions to really push forward that research agenda. So I think having the liberal arts education as a basis with which to learn how to work effectively with individuals has really helped me understand the collaborative nature of research um, in the real world. And I also want to stress that, that uh, none of this was pre-programmed. <laughs> this, this, what, what you're hearing, I think, is exactly what uh, any educator would want uh, students to come away with uh, from their college education. So um, I think very interesting in that regard. But the second question <clears throat> I'd like to pose, and, and this again is, you don't have to answer in any particular order, is really having to do with the um, link to civic engagement. So how did you come to value linking interest in the world beyond the campus to your academic programs? Um, I think that uh, not only with the <coughs> experience with this indigenous community, but other um, experiences that Wagner provides in working with the community. We, in Staten Island, we have a really strong um, presence of uh, Latin Americans or immigrants. Um, and I think that I learned to value my education because I was able to apply everything I learned um, into like understanding how communities and the world works a little bit better for me. Um, so I sort of have a two-part answer to this. So the first comes from just a sort of general question in my mind as to why teach math at the college level. Um, and that's something that I can sort of wrestle with as to most students that I'll be teaching won't ever use calculus or any of those skills in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and I talked to my advisor about this, and she said that one of the things she remembered from one of her early classes was that her math teacher said, I'm not teaching you like the math, but I'm also teaching you how to think. So I think that if I can teach a next generation of people how to be effective thinkers, problem solvers, then that can have really exponential, um, like a really big 
implication on our world because I'll be like helping to teach those people how to think um, and be problem solvers. Um, and then the other part of my answer is also that as a member of the LGBTQIA community, we see a underrepresentation in the STEM fields. So I would like to sort of help make, do my part to be visible in the STEM fields in order to help um, other people find that it actually is like a really good field to go into. Because um, sometimes we see that um, just that lack of visibility, people think, oh, maybe this wouldn't be an inclusive field for me, um, when that's actually not the case. So trying to do more in that sense of um, civic engagement. Um, I value my liberal arts education because for me, it made me a more well-rounded individual in terms of venturing out into the real world. Like I could go out and hold a conversation with anybody about any kind of subject. Because for me, like the world isn't just physics, which is my major. You know, I'm able to talk to other people about just non-physics stuff, and then I know more than just physics, which you know I appreciate because I like talking to people. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then in terms of civil engagement, my, the summer I was doing my first research project, I was also teaching an outreach class for underprivileged high schoolers, and I think that's really important because you need to give um, students that early kind of push towards STEM because otherwise they won't really get that interest. So the class was a basic electronics class, which is really important because, you know, that's kind of some stuff that you don't really learn until much later on, but it's important to get a grasp of that because the world needs more STEM people. Thank you. Uh, so uh, now we come to the uh, unscripted part of our program, truly unscripted, but I think first a round of applause yeah. for our panelists. So thank you all very much for, for your remarks. So the floor is open, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, the mic. the mic, yeah, good. So if you have some questions, okay. Uh, I think I can speak up loud enough. I'm dying to ask Jack because I live in New York City. Okay, uh, I'm dying to ask Jack because I live in New York City and actually my colleague here, both of us love Broadway. I want to hear your hypothesis on who's gonna win the Tonys. I need to know what shows I should be going to. Um, so that actually hasn't been decided yet. So um, I'm still in the process Well, of, it's a hypothesis, so it's an educated guess. I wanna hear your educated guess. Honestly, I haven't even looked at this yet. Um, so I've been mainly dealing with the past 10 years of data um, to see which quantifiers can be best predictors, um, but I'm sort of waiting until the nomination process comes out, so I'm looking at a smaller subset of data um, to know of the four to five nominees for each category, which one will be the winner. Um, so what are some of the major quantifiers? Um, so that goes back to the... What are the major quantifiers? Um, the five that I was looking at were the weekly gross, the weekly average ticket price, the top ticket price, the percentage of seats sold, and then the number of seats sold. Hi, this is uh, another question for Jack Ryan. Um, so you did all this research. Uh, did you back test your model and how did it fit um, existing uh, Tony Award winners? Um, yeah, so that's the majority of the project. So looking at data from the past 10 years and seeing um, how these different methods rank each set of shows for that particular year and then looking at which ones were actually successful in that, and then using that as a basis to build the one that we're going to use for the predictor for this year. Um, so as I mentioned, we're still not done like deciding which method we're going to use for this coming year, so I'm still in the process of comparing it to previous results. Yeah, my question, um, uh, I happen to have a little bit of inside information being the president of North Central that um, uh, Jack, at least is, in addition to all the other wonderful things he's doing in the research, is also a residence hall assistant and a tour guide for prospective students on campus. Uh, my question comes to, as uh, Bill Sullivan was talking about earlier, the impact of the residential uh, community on the experience of students at schools like uh, NAC and uh, uh, institutions, and wondering if um, our speakers would like to address like the impact of that, that residential community on their education as a whole or perhaps on their, specifically on their, their research. Um, 
Um, so for me particularly, when I started at the undergrad level, I was living in our College Scholars Honors dorm. Um, so all of the students who were living in that building with me were chosen because of their academic um, path. And that was really helpful for me because I found myself constantly being challenged in the conversations we were having. So when we'd all go out for dinner, we wouldn't just have small talk, we'd be talking about like the really big important things. Um, so it challenged your ability to like defend arguments for yourself and to think critically in that way. And they're also the people who are in all of your classes with you and like challenging you to be the best version of yourself. And you're also not having to deal with, um, in that setting, like the people who aren't as academically motivated, like criticizing you for wanting to work on homework every night. Um, so in that respect, I think like the liberal arts education is great in that it like promotes um, discussions like that, and by having um, students in those types of situations, but then also just looking at the residence halls more broadly, um, having the opportunity to be in the res halls, I think, really helps you in all those different areas, like collaboration, I was mentioning, um, conflict resolution, being forced to live with someone um, in a small space can be challenging sometimes, but it can also lead to personal growth. Um, and then it's also important to realize that by living on campus, you're gaining a lot of time that you could be spending commuting, um, and you can have different access to resources that you wouldn't necessarily have. Um, so I think it, while like not critical to the liberal arts experience, I think definitely living on campus can help um, promote a lot of different things. Um, for me, I think it living um, away from home in residences um, helps you learn so many things about yourself, uh, how to manage your time, your money, everything. Um, it also um, helps you relate with other people. In my case, it had been like three years since I've spoken English like constantly, so it was a challenge to <coughs> have to speak English all the time. Um, when otherwise, if I didn't live in the residencies, I would have like um, just kept in my small world. Um, but yeah, I think living in residencies definitely um, broadens your mind also to other people who think differently, uh, especially when there's international students involved and it just learns, um, helps you learn about the, the place in which you are. Um, I live 10 minutes away from my school, so I commute. <laughs> but if you ask my mom, um, I'm there from eight to nine every day, so I'm just always there. And for me, the key was just a really small set of majors. Like, our school, I think, is 3,000 students. There's only 10 physics majors throughout all four years. And then our faculty is also small, so we have a very tight-knit department, which I believe is key for, like, anything, because very personal and intimate experiences. And then when I was doing research, or even, like, the coursework, it's a good sense of competitiveness, but not so much that the other students like are discouraging or like would make fun of you. Like we're all just like a big family almost. You know, we'll always hang out in the department room with our advisor, kind of just talk to him casually, <laughs> and it's nice. Yeah. Uh, uh, Andy Workman, uh, Roger Williams University. It's a little bit different kind of question. I'm interested in how each of you chose the institution that you're at now. I imagine you all had a lot of different uh, options but what attracted you to this particular kind of education? And also, was the kind of education you actually got what you perceived when you were looking at colleges about these institutions? Um, well, for me, I was looking, I knew I wanted to study abroad, so I was looking at various universities, and I chose Wagner because of its size and uh, its location and also the, the majors it offered. Um, but it just seemed like the right amount of size uh, for me because I, I was nervous into moving uh, like into another country. And I think that uh, having such a sm small size classroom, it just really helps you, like your voice is heard, um, your questions are answered. Um, you get to know your professors in, in a more intimate way. So it just helps um, understand the topic better, I think. And well, I think that was for me. And also that I wasn't completely sure which major I wanted to, to do. So I knew Wagner was uh, offering the, the majors I, 
I was most interested in, and that it offered the opportunity that um, to try a lot of different things without losing a lot of time. And that was. Um, I went to a, a rather small high school, so when I was looking at colleges, I knew I wanted a smaller one as opposed to a larger <laughs> one. Where, like my physics 101 class, the first physics class that I took. It had only 20 students, and I knew if I went to a larger school that I would have been in a lecture hall with like 150 students. I would have never seen the professor. So when I was looking at colleges, I was looking for that. And the other thing I was looking for was a liberal arts college, actually, because my high school, I really enjoyed learning all the other classes and subjects. So when I was looking for a college, I didn't want just, say, you know, technological institute. I wanted a nice, well-rounded place. Um, so for me, it was a combination of the location. I liked being close to the city of Chicago, but not necessarily living in the city. Um, I was originally in secondary education until I decided that I'd rather teach at the college level, and we have a great education program. And one of the main things was that I wanted to pursue a theater major um, while also pursuing another degree as well. And there were a lot of schools I looked at that that wasn't the case. So those were sort of the main reasons I picked North Central. But I like your question about um, like how was the education you got like what you thought you were going to? And I'm gonna say no, I did not expect to receive such a high quality of education. Um, I didn't go into the liberal arts education thinking about all the distinctive academic opportunities, <laughs> grants, researches, um, travel funding, all those different opportunities. I sort of went into it blindedly and honestly have learned more about um, the admission process from the eyes of a tour guide so I can speak more to those different things and help our um, incoming students realize those. Um, but I will say I've been thoroughly impressed and um, happy that I chose North Central just because of the different opportunities. Um, but it wasn't something that I actively like sought out. I just got lucky, I think. You all have cited um, the importance of having a good working relationship with, with your advisors or professors. Um, and I, I just, the question I have is, how has the ability to just go into their office and sit down and talk with them about anything influenced you, and how will that help you in your future? For me, it removed the intimidation factor <coughs> that I had going in as a freshman, which I think is a big deal, because when, especially at the graduate level, you need to be able to just talk to your advisor about anything, you know, and not be afraid and you know have the courage to ask questions if you need to ask. And so that's what I appreciate the most working for the past two years with my professors, that I'm able just to go talk to him about anything. And when I was at CERN, I was with him, and we actually like would hang out every once in a while over there in France, in Geneva. We went hiking once, and he told me a lot of different stories about him when he was younger. And it's just, it's a really nice thing when you're able to build that kind of relationship with a professor. Because I feel like in a lot of places, you really don't get that. You're often just interacting with a teacher assistant. I think for me, the main thing is um, just looking at it from like a networking point of view. So when I can get to know a professor on like a person to person level, then they're able to open different resources for me, whether that's from like letters of recommendation or me helping me meet different people. Um, so one like really cool opportunity I had last um, January at the joint math meetings in San Antonio was to meet um, one of the professors who was running a research program that I was applying for because of a personal contact with one of my advisors. So he was able to talk to her about me and I was able to meet her. And then when I went to apply, they were able to put a face to the application and it, I think it really helped me get that position and I ended up taking it over the summer. Um, so different things like that, when you're at that small school and they can talk to your not only academic abilities, but to who you are as a person, because whenever you're applying for a job or graduate school, they want to know like what type of person they're going to be working with. So I think it can be beneficial in that way, in addition to just um, obtaining that personal relationship with them. Um, I agree with uh, both of them in that it's uh, nice to have like a personal relationship with your advisor in that they actually know who you are, they know how you work. <coughs> um, the networking part is very helpful also. Um, my professors have like in several occasions gave, uh, open, like given me opportunities to continue my career path. And um, also because my advisor is doing similar work as, a, as I'm interested in, um, it is kind of a form of ins uh, inspiration, academic insight, um, like that. 
I'm Rita Thakur from University of Laverne, California. Is any one of you first generation student? Is what? what? First generation student? Oh, no. First to go to college? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, my question is, how do you think that first generation students would have built the confidence you have right now in the college life? Um, I believe that a big key to college success is the ability to choose what it is you want to study. Because you could go to Manhattan College and be undecided and then, you know, kind of take a different, a bunch of different classes to figure out what you like. So for a first generation student, I would recommend doing a liberal arts college because they could have, they can explore what it is they like and then they could find what it is that they love, what it is that they are passionate about. And yeah, so that's it. Um, I agree. I think that the liberal arts education does um, work well for first generation college students. I have a lot of my peers and colleagues who are first gen at North Central. Um, one of the things we do is we have a premier scholars program that runs for a few weeks before everyone else moves in and you have the opportunity to take a mock class and get onto campus early, establish a lot of those different relationships. And I see a lot of first generation college students at North Central really achieving tremendous accomplishments, um, going to different conferences and presenting their research. Um, one of my best friends is a first gen student. She just got accepted into two PhD programs in stats at NC State and then University of Iowa. Um, so really achieving some really tremendous things. Um, and I do think that having that welcoming atmosphere is the perfect environment for it. Um, one of the things I try to do is whenever I have like a student who's touring as a first generation college student, I try to just give all the answers to the questions I think that the parents may not even know that they have. Um, I think that's one of the hard things about selecting a school when you are a first generation college student is that you perhaps don't even know what types of questions to answer or what to look for. So I try to be as open and upfront about that um, from very early on. So I think a lot of the different ways that the liberal arts education is structured um, does aid first generation students well. But obviously I can't speak to that too much personally um, since I'm not. Um, for me, I also think that um, the liberal arts colleges are like designed in a good way for like <coughs> students to explore their interests and um, that, um, and also that um, maybe to apply to a smaller college would be good because I feel like small colleges have the potential of like you can do almost anything like you can create a club or like you can make you can build it up instead of like just uh, like appearing somewhere that may already have everything done and it might seem more intimidating, but it's like according to each person. <laughs> Look, is there anything that, uh, just building on this, is there anything that in your first year experience, in the first year programs you might have been involved with that was particularly helpful in terms of opening you up, giving you a sense of the broader world around you and also maybe connecting you to particular professors or seeing the relationship between different disciplines. What, what happened in your first year if there was a first year program? Um, so we had a first year experience course where we met weekly um, in a group of um, students. And one of the things that I enjoyed particularly about mine being in the um, honors program was that ours was more interdisciplinary by nature. Most students were um, are sort of sorted by major. That way you have a professor who's in your field. So I ended up in a with a professor who was a religious studies professor, so really not my discipline. Um, but it was cool being able to work with a team of scholars who were all coming from different backgrounds. Um, I think another aspect of the first year that really helped me was that I had the full professors for all my introductory math courses. So I started in at the Calc 3 level, um, and I had the regular full-time professors who are teaching those upper level courses. So I was able to start making those relationships from day one, even before that when we had like getting to know you events, things like that. Um, so I think being able to be around those types of opportunities with different scholars and working with the real people in my field from day one um, really helped me realize that I did want to pursue something um, go farther in my studies of math than be a secondary ed teacher? Um, for me, I think it was that in Wagner we have the learning um, reflective tutorial in which um, we 
uh, as freshmen entering to <coughs> this course that combines two, um, two careers, uh, two different disciplines, and then like you have to analyze it in like uniting both in a way. Uh, so for me, it was um, American art history and American literature, which weren't my major, but uh, still, it just um, helps me helped me um, gain like a wider perspective of about different things. And even now, on my senior year, I still. Um, have like I still talk with my professors from freshman year and I see their perspectives for me we had science section only classes for math chemistry and physics my first year which I think was really good because I was able to see my other physics major in the classroom setting and chemistry majors in math and we also started having building those better relationships with the professors earlier on with these classes and just any other questions? Um, Bill, did you want to make any? Okay. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming today and thank our students um, for coming. <laughs> and thank you, Bill, for moderating this session. And I, I, you have a flyer about the book that Bill has written, and I think there are stories from the other 22 members of our, our consortium in that book, and I think you'll find it highly readable and um, informative about what our campuses and I think other campuses in higher ed as well are trying to do in terms of giving students, as Bill said, and the students I think have articulated quite well, the richness of a liberal arts education but also paying attention to the fact that they're going to be citizens of the world and we want them to have that civic engagement experience um, while they're in college. And we know that they need to get a job when they leave. <laughs> and, and we want them to be employable and to have a job, a position that they're really going to enjoy and I think as the student said, be passionate about and wake up every morning thinking, this is great, I get to go to work and do what I love doing. So. Um, as I said uh, earlier, I guess, or yesterday, I, I really, you know, meeting young people like the students that are here um, gives you uh, a, a real sense of where the world is going to be going. And I think it, it inspires confidence that we are still on, on the right track and, and that our students are going to lead our nation in the world in a direction that ultimately is going to make lives better for everyone. In, in the world. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you, Bill, and thank all of you for coming.